Mid-August 1944. The German army has been defeated in the Battle of Normandy, and is now retreating towards its border at full speed. One such unit is the elite Lair Panzer Division, which after fighting intensely for the past two months is completely depleted. A week ago in the first part of this series, we saw the history of the Panzer Lair from its creation to the end of the Battle of Normandy. Today, the time has come to conclude this miniseries about this unit, for which, we are going to analyze how the last offensives in which this division participated were, and how it ended. With that said, let's pick up where we left off in the previous program. When the Panzer Lair reached the German border at the end of August, it was so weakened that it could not stay to shore up the new defensive line that was forming at full speed, so it had to be sent to Paderborn to recover. With this action, it was also intended to once again have a powerful Panzer Division, which could be used in a future offensive operation. This would be neither more nor less than the one that was being organized in the Ardennes, whose planning began precisely in mid-September. However, as was the case with all the elite divisions of the German army, each time they had to be reconstituted at full speed after being torn to pieces, their combat value was considerably reduced. This was because the fast-trained new recruits could not match the old veteran soldiers, nor those men who had been training for months and even years. Thus, this was no exception for the Panzer Lair Division, which was reconstituted during September and October, and could no longer be staffed with as select personnel, nor with as much material as it had been at the beginning of 1944. By the end of October, Panzer Lair had some 12,000 troops and almost 100 armored vehicles of all kinds, of which about 35 were Panzer IVs, and 38 Panthers, along with 21 tank destroyers. As we can see, it was no longer that elite division with more than 200 tanks and hundreds of half-tracks, which made it a fully motorized and highly mobile unit. Although in these months it was recovering and re-equipping for the offensive that was being prepared in the Ardennes, this period was interrupted by the advance that the Americans were making near Alsace, and at the end of November, the Panzer Lair had to be sent near from Strasbourg. There he was able to participate in a series of combats that did not prevent the Americans from reaching the Rhine River near Strasbourg. However, this counterattack that I carried out took its toll and the Panzer Lair was weakened. Thus, the division was again claimed in the German concentration area for the launch of the new offensive in the Ardennes, and the Panzer Lair moved to the northeast. Due to this recent combat, the Panzer Lair was no longer ready to participate in this operation in the Ardennes, but it had to do it with what it had. This meant that it was quickly reinforced with two new armored battalions, bringing it to a total of 30 Panthers, 27 Panzer IVs and 20 tank destroyers. Finally, the Panzer Lair was framed within Manchufel's 5th Panzer Army, which had a total of four Volksgrenadier divisions and three Panzer divisions, one of them being our protagonist. This 5th Panzer Army would occupy the center of the German penetration, having the 6th Panzer Army to the north, and the 7th Army to the south, which had to protect its left flank. His goal was to break through to Brussels, and finish closing the pincer that would take the 6th Panzer Army to the city of Antwerp. The Panzer Lair began the attack on December 16, along with most of the German units. However, it soon got stuck due to the collapse of the communication routes and its progress slowed down. Little by little over the next few days he was able to work his way out of the bottleneck that had formed, although as he mixed with the 26th Volksgrenadier Division moving on horseback, his speed was similarly reduced. This was one of the main problems that, in general, all the mechanized or motorized units that participated in this offensive in the Ardennes had. To this lack of roads suitable for heavy vehicles, we must also add the lack of fuel, and the difficulty they had in getting it to the vanguard of the panzers. After some fighting and after overcoming rivers such as the Clerf, on December 18 the panzer lair reached the famous city of Bastona. There the division was divided, and part of it remained to help in the assault on Bastogne, while the rest continued advancing towards the river Meuse. Together with the 2nd Panzer Division, the Panzer Lair became the spearhead of the entire German offensive, and they were the most advanced units of all those that participated in this offensive in the Ardennes. It was in the vicinity of Roquefort that the Panzer Lair was finally stopped, and from that point on, it began to be pressured on all flanks by the reinforcing American forces. During the last days of December, 
The Panzer layer was sent to the west of Bastogne to stop the attack that the Americans were launching from the south. At that moment it was clear that the German offensive had failed, and the fighting that was now taking place was a fight not to be surrounded, before an enemy that was pressing them on all sides. Thus, a totally depleted and exhausted Panzer layer had to withdraw little by little to its starting positions, which it reached by mid-January. Again on this occasion it had to be reconstituted from practically zero, and this time the difference with that division that had been at the beginning of 1944, was even bigger. It should be noted that the situation in mid-January was desperate for the Germans, as the Red Army had broken through the Vistula front and was advancing at full speed towards Berlin. This meant that there were not many men or equipment to rearm the Panzer Lair, since the collapse on the Eastern Front absorbed everything. In any case, once the Panzer Lair could be refitted again, it was sent to the Rhineland, to hold up the British advance and prevent them from crossing the Rhine and reaching the Ruhr Basin. Later during the month of March, it was transferred a little further south, to contain the Americans who had crossed the Raymagen Bridge and had established a bridgehead in the sector. By the date of March 15, the Panzer Lair had only six Panzer III, 29 Panthers and 14 tank destroyers. In these attacks to try to expel the Allies to the other side of the Rhine, the Panzer Lair was very crushed, and could not meet that objective. Thus, at the end of the month, the division had only 300 men and 15 tanks, having less combat value than a battalion. From there, he could only wait to receive the final blow. This came about when the Americans began their offensive south of the Ruhr on March 24, gradually isolating hundreds of thousands of German soldiers in what would become known as the Ruhr Pocket. Finally, the Panzer Lair could not do anything to prevent this, and the Ruhr Pocket closed in the vicinity of Paderborn on April 2. This was one of the biggest failures of the German army on the Western Front, which made clear the little strength and mobility they had during that month of March 1945. Thus, the few troops that remained of this old elite division were part of the more than 300,000 combatants that the Allies took prisoner, in the pocket of the Ruhr Basin. Without a doubt, a very little legendary end for an elite division like the Panzer Lair, which if you remember from the first program, had been created with enough power to throw the Allies into the sea by itself. If you want to refresh that first program on this unit, I leave said program in the description. Well. Here we end the story of the Panzer Lair. Thank you all for being part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and we'll see each other here as always, next Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.